I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today, I had some questions first about opening a model train museum and then a follow-up question about opening a model train store. So I'm gonna delve into that a little bit today. I pre-recorded some of this and I'm editing it back together because I wanted to answer this question and I think it's good for everyone. Before you jump away, say I'm not really interested in model trains, I think that the idea of talking about why a business idea specifically like this that's so very Western European, North American, uh, and why it may not work in a place where, why wouldn't it work? It's good to see this because as foreigners moving to Nicaragua, it is so tempting to think that we can just start businesses and bring all kinds of things that are missing to Nicaragua to Nicaragua. And in reality, that's very rarely the case. There's a reason why these things don't already exist here. So I think it's worth it for everyone to follow along and, and see as we break down what would be potentially wrong with a business idea like this here in Nicaragua. We're gonna get to that right after the bump. Hey guys, we're back with a special episode because I have a viewer question to answer about model railroading business opportunities here in Nicaragua. Okay, so Jason asked, and this is public in the forum, Jason asked, I was thinking if I moved there to start a model railroad museum, I could have three or four trains and charge the local kids $2 to drive the trains for an hour. Do you uh, know any good places in Leon? That would be good for that. Okay, so let me start off with I love model trains. I've always loved model trains. This is fantastic. I have had this idea myself, uh, almost you know, doing a model train museum, um, and and it, it would be fantastic. My kids are interested in doing model trains a little bit. It's not a huge thing. My wife enjoys doing model trains with me a little bit. Like it's not like a huge thing, but we've we've always liked it. And I grew up doing model trains with my father, and and he always did model trains. So this is a thing that I very I I really wish we had. So I wanted to talk about this because, yeah, okay. So let's start with what are the, uh, what is the availability of model train stuff, right? We're talking engines, we're talking cars, we're talking track, we're talking electric, we're talking just basic stuff, not even that new like cool computer controlled stuff, like the old fashioned stuff, flocking and plaster. So basically none of this is available in Nicaragua. That's a starting point of problems here is that um, I can't go to the store and, and start doing model trains. Now I can ship all that stuff to some place with boxes in the United States and have it shipped down for me here. That's not particularly a problem, but you're, you're just gonna pay a premium for that. Meaning, you're not gonna probably pay a big import on that unless you're starting a model train store and you're bringing in crate loads of stuff. But if you're just buying for you, even if it's quite a bit of stuff, as it would be if you're doing a project of this magnitude, uh, you're probably fine. There's probably like no specific import taxes on that. It's all personal hobby material. Can't be used for really anything else. So um, uh, you're only going to be paying a premium because you're going to, for example, have a box somewhere in the United States that you're shipping from Amazon or Walters or whatever. They're going to ship there. You're going to accumulate this stuff, and then they're going to ship it to Nicaragua for you. That's fine. No problem. But uh, that shipping is going to be easily at least 10% more on top of the normal cost of railroading stuff, and it could be quite a bit more depending on how heavy it is, how bulky it is, how small of an order you want to do at a time, those kinds of things. So just be aware where this isn't going to be the kind of hobby where being in Nicaragua is somehow going to make it cheaper. It's going to be where it makes it more expensive. Now, of course, your life is cheaper in Nicaragua, so maybe that makes it all worthwhile. And if this is the hobby you have, yeah, like if this is something that I was going to dedicate space and time to, no problem, right? Done. Uh, the, the little bit of extra to pay for the flocking to get here, it's not, my, my miniature trees are going to get down here, going to cost a little bit extra, not a problem. So just be aware that that is a, a thing. You're any little thing. If you're used to doing this in like the United States or Germany, for example, uh, it's so easy to go out and just, oh, I, I need this, you know, wiring. I need this glue. I need this paint. I need this, you name it. I'm just going to stop by the store this afternoon and good to go. Or I'm just going to hop on Amazon. It'll be here in a few hours. That kind, this is a kind of hobby that can be greatly impacted by that huge delay in getting stuff into Nicaragua. So being like, oh, I just need this little tiny thing to finish this little house that I'm more, I just got to put this decal on. Oh, I'm out of, oh, it's going to be two weeks, right? So that, that kind of stuff can be very negative. So just, just keep that in mind. It, it does not to deter you. Just the, that is going to be your challenge. That and the heat is right. So you normally, most places that are doing model railroading do so in 
relatively controlled temperatures that are relatively cool. That doesn't mean that trains won't work and stuff in warmer temperatures. Just be aware that everything you do in Nicaragua is going to be warmer than somewhere else. And model trains are one of the things where the constant slightly warmer temperature could have an impact on things. Or your need to air condition more could make for an expense that you were not foreseeing. Not a big deal. Again, just things to be thoughtful of when, when kind of looking at this as an idea. And of course, you can do model trains outside. Right? Like, they still work. I mean, you got to cover them, obviously. You can't just have them in the rain, but you don't. You can be in open air. Just be aware that that has ramifications, and you're going to get bugs. You're going to get, you know, humidity, whatever, if you don't have controlled environments. So all things to just play into your, your thought processes when doing this. Now, where could you do it? Would it be of interest? So the, the toughest thing, and I love, I grew up going to, to model train museums. My family would take trips to go see model train museums uh, as a child. I love them. I think they're so cool. It is such a great family activity. It's such a, you know, peaceful, tranquilo activity. Now, all that said, it is important to understand a couple things. One is that there are no trains in Nicaragua. So there's no train trains currently. We're getting them, so super exciting. Um, but we don't have them today, so there isn't this train consciousness in the way that there is in the United States. One of the reasons that I love trains, growing up, I had the Genesee and Wyoming Railroad right down the street from me. And, um, and I have model trains from the Genesee because I love modeling the trains that we had, right? So um, I had this, this uh, romanticism about trains because I grew up in a place where trains were there, and it's like, oh, I wonder where they journey to. Of course, the GNW went down the street and right back, so it was not that, that magical. But if you saw Amtrak somewhere, where is it off to? My gosh, it's going to Chicago. Chicago? I don't even know where that is. That's far away, right? Like, it was, it was trains are magic. Without having trains to see, the idea that other countries have trains loses something. Ah, yeah, we've seen them in pictures, whatever, it's not a big deal. Um, and so the idea of a model train museum is less obvious to a Nicaraguan child or family than it would be to an American one. So you're starting with a, why would I want to go see that? What's the interest? What's the magic in that? And modeling is not an activity that is done here, to the best of my knowledge, by much of anyone. So you also have the problem that modeling is not a thing that kids here generally do. They could, and someone does, but it's not the level of hobby that it is in the United States. It's also not the level of hobby today that it was when we were kids. We being, I don't know how old you are, but I'm pushing 50. And when I was a kid, modeling anything was like a really big activity that we did a lot of. It was just, you know, keeping the kids busy. What are you going to have them do? We're gonna, we got them a model kit. Or we got them a model railroad. We got whatever. And we're like building stuff. Partially because getting parts and stuff is hard here. Protecting things is hard here. People don't have like spare rooms to, to safely put things in. People don't tend to have hobby rooms, right? The extra space in their houses to do these things, to set things up. And like there's just a lot of moving pieces to this that uh, make it less popular in society. So because people don't do this as a hobby, they're less likely to understand why they go to you doing, the, doing this as a hobby. So you have a bunch of challenges here to getting into the consciousness of people in Nicaragua and being like, here's a thing you might be interested in and here's why. In the United States, you say trains, you say models, you say museum, and people are just like, I got this. I know why I want to go or don't want to go. And you're only going to get a small segment of the population, but it's a big population and people instantly know what it is. If you are dealing with uh, uh, Nicaraguans and they have, they've never seen anything like this, they have no knowledge of model trains, they barely have knowledge of trains, they barely have mo knowledge of modeling, um, to then have a museum about this is going to be fundamentally confusing or abstract and, and getting the word out so that people actually come will be hard. Okay, so that kind of, that kind of establishes that piece. And then one last piece is that this is a very chill activity. And Nicaraguans aren't known for doing chill activities. Nicaraguans have a tendency to do very active activities, hence the name. Uh, so it tends to be loud music. Loud to a level you don't, you, you just can't. Um, it's, it's going out and, and like dancing. It's going out and moving around. Going out and doing something quiet and, and relaxing and very, very tranquil is not the norm. Not the way it is in the U.S. and Canada, where most of our activities are very chill. And, and like day to day, we just, oh, how do we find our spot to relax today? Nicaraguans are completely the opposite. They're always looking for how they can do something exciting. They're always looking for something that's going to get them moving and, and talking and, and, you know, 
So having uh, a quiet activity, while it's a novel thing and super cool, also has the challenge that people will not understand fundamentally the expected behavior, the expected interaction with it. Now, that's not to say there aren't art museums that are very quiet. And you're supposed to, you know, not talk loudly and look at the artwork, uh, but they're also not that packed with Nicaraguans. Nicaraguans go and they appreciate it, but an art museum is a much more understood thing. So they're like, art museum, it's a solemn occasion, right? Um, so, and even churches are loud and, and like living in a church's neighborhood can be a problem because churches are so loud and so anything but solemn, anything but tranquil, that you're like, oh, I can't talk to people because the church is so loud two blocks away. Real thing. I lived in La Barrio. La Barrio Church is so loud that you can spend whole portions of your day unable to have conversations because you can't talk over the noise that they're blasting from the church. So just, just think about this in a, in a social context, the cultural context. You may be... Uh, challenged in ways you would not anticipate when looking to do this. Okay, now from a business perspective, I am sure that Jason who posted this is not thinking that this is going to pay his bills and he's going to live off of, you know, he's not a 25 year old, I assume, first of all, 25 year olds don't think of this, um, who is thinking that this is the greatest business opportunity that's ever been and uh, why bother, you know, being an engineer when you could, well, when you could be an engineer, right? When you could be a model engineer. Um, so, even in the United States, right? Model train museums are extremely costly to produce, even when you have that lower cost, uh, even when you have the right weather, all those things. And they're very hard to market and bring people in. Um, so even in the US, people do it as a way to either offset their, the cost of their hobby, which it might, it might help reduce the overhead that they're putting in, um, or they do it be, just to share their hobby with the world. No one really does it for the idea of being profitable. And that's fine. Well, museums are not really meant to be profitable. That's so. That's that's great. Um, uh, could you charge children two dollars to drive the trains for an hour? My guess is no. Um, the idea that you could drive trains is is probably going to be a little bit abstract. And two dollars is a lot of money for the bulk of the population uh, to give to children to go just drive trains around. Uh, would someone do it? I'm sure they would. Right? Would you have a few people on a regular basis? But would it be enough to cover any expense? Probably not. Um, you know, if you're going to charge more like uh, 50 cents or, or something to that, that accord, I think um, that would be closer. But then, you know, is it even worth charging? It's almost worth charging only so people don't just come in and do it all the time. Well, it's free. I'm just going to stay here and do it for forever. Uh, and then you're like, no, 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 you got to kick out. Yeah, you should come up with something. But I think, I think $2 is actually quite high. Um, something closer to 50 cord, which is a little bit more than a dollar, but it's not $2 would be better. And maybe 40 cord, like for real, you know, you're looking at um, you're looking at hours of average labor uh, in order to to generate the money for the kids to do that, uh, and so that's um, you know for for wealthier middle class this would be trivial, but for a lot of Nicaraguans who would benefit most from an activity like this, it could be a burdensome cost, and I, and I think you would find very few people willing to pay that uh, very often, and so you'd probably be empty weeks at a time before someone came in to pay that kind of money. Uh, and, and would you charge for admission or have free admission? Like these are not things that are mentioned here. I don't know, right? It's, uh, and are you open every day? Are you open one day a week? Like there's a lot of, like it, there's just not gonna be a lot of demand for anything like that. That's, that's obvious. But is it something that could be beneficial? Is it something that could be fun? And a lot of that comes down to how much money are you willing to lose to do this how much time do you want to put into it? Um, and is this like, I'm going to spend $100,000 on model railroads, whether it's a museum or not. Wouldn't it be cool if I made it available to the community so the community children can see it and learn about trains and modeling? Heck yeah, that's awesome, right? If, if that's your only concern, I just want to share my hobby with Nicaragua, then this is brilliant, right? And, and absolutely, I applaud the idea and, and the effort um, and, the, and the willingness to potentially do so uh, is certainly something that I've, I have been like, well, wouldn't this be a fun thing to do? It absolutely would. I think it would be great, but who has the time to, to build a museum? Um, and in the United States, again, when you're building a museum, typically you have a group of modelers who do it. Maybe not. Maybe this is just your full-time thing and you can just, you know, it'll still be tough. Um, typically, those things are modeling clubs and they have, you know, five to 20 people who are modeling very seriously. 
and they all take on either different types of projects or different portions or whatever. And there's a lot of different ways you could approach this. And I've had a lot of ideas over the years. Do you make individual rooms that have vignettes? Do you do the traditional thing in the United States? It's traditional to do a, a pole barn type structure sealed, of course, uh, with just one big table in the middle and you walk around. Of course, that was when I was a kid. Things have advanced a lot. Now you have computer controlled things that do a lot of interesting things. Now you don't really drive trains. The trains drive themselves. Uh, there's, there's so much stuff. Do you do you know, there's just what do you do? What do you? There's so much you could do with it, that um, that that there's a lot of a lot of openness there. Do I know of good space? So all this, all this is kind of a background. So it's not it's not a viable business as as far as making money, but it is definitely the kind of thing that the population would be like, yeah, knock yourself out. The government would be like, this is a fantastic thing. Go do this. Um, you know, like everyone involved would be like, thank you for making a museum, even though no one wants to go to it. Like, that's cool. Uh, you would get tourists who would go to it from time to time, I'm sure. Hey, Leon has a, a model train museum. Are you kidding me? I don't even see those in the States anymore. Yeah, you could totally do that. So is there, do I know of any good places in Leon for that? So what I'll say is a lot of this comes down to uh, your budget. I know some places that would be absolutely fantastic for it. They're also going for a half million dollars because they're prime bar space right in the middle of the colonial city. And when you're in those, like we're talking really big places right downtown. Um, and, and I know we always say like, oh, the prices here are so low. Yes, those places in the United States would be $50 million, right? So, so half a million, and I can tell you, no one's buying it for half a million, right? I have been asked to go look at places. I go into places that are there listed at these prices and we just laugh and walk out. We're like, you, you have no concept um, of what, uh, what things would cost. But the reason that they're asking that much is because they know someone with millions and millions and millions of dollars will come in, bulldoze the place and build a mansion on the space. And so they're, they're hoping for someone who's just willing to throw money at it, who doesn't care, uh, and they're gonna hold out for that. Um, but there are spaces where businesses have failed previously. It's not even worth keeping doors open. So there's zero business money in it. So there are loads of places downtown that are held by people who are just hopeful that crazy foreigners are going to spend an outrageous amounts of money. And otherwise, they keep them empty indefinitely because they're not really worth very much. And so they're willing to just let them go fallow. Unfortunately, that's a problem we have here in Nicaragua. So the prime large spaces downtown uh, that are available are generally going to be outrageously expensive. Um, and nothing is going to be well designed for this purpose, right? Some places are just going to be big open spaces and you can work with that quite a bit, but very little is sealed. Everything is dusty. Nicaragua is dusty in general. So that's something you're going to have to tackle a lot. You're probably going to want to take a large building, seal it heavily, not just from outside air, but you're going to want to like paint the walls because everything's concrete. So you're going to have to cover everything in some kind of coating to make sure you're not getting dust from the structure as well. And you're going to need to have a lot of air conditioning with a lot of filtration. You're going to want to add a lot of uh, just air filtration in general to constantly pull dust out of the air, or you're going to be in a situation where everything's going to be covered in dust all the time, and it's not going to it's not going to be functional as a museum. So that's going to be a major cost that you have to deal with, and makes large spaces with large open air impractical in a lot of situations. Like it's just going to be so much dust that you won't be able to clean that air. And, and as people come and go, you're gonna need man traps for coming into the buildings. That's something that no one has currently to control the dust coming in from the outside, not for security, uh, for from security from dust, if you wanna think of it that way. So that's a big challenge. That's, that's something you have to just consider when you're looking at any space. Now, if you're gonna do things outside, again, the dust will be outrageous, but at least it's outside, so you kind of expect it to be a little bit challenging. This means that larger scales are going to make more sense. A lot of times museums opt for HO scale just because you can do more faster, but you may want to be looking at O and G scale because you need to go really, really big um, to, to, de to make the dust less of a factor. It's much easier to deal with those things. If you're doing N or Z scale, TT scale, things like that, you're going to end up with the dust being so significant compared to the size of the models that it may be much more problematic. So that's something to consider as well. Uh, a lot of structures that are going to be reasonable reasonable for this are what we call colonials. That means they have open courtyard, uh, they have roofs that overhang, uh, and it, those will be very challenging to work with. However, there are things you can do. Uh, what some places like the um, uh, Ortiz Gurdian Museum has done for some of their new art exhibits, they, they take these old colonial structures, they're beautiful old structures, but they're wide open, and they coat the inside of the courtyard with glass. This is of course very expensive, but this is what you have to do when you're doing museums. 
and they, therefore they're able to air seal them while maintaining the look of the old structure. And then the, the courtyards are just this beautiful green area in the middle that you can look at, but you can't get to. And um, and they do this with their other museums, but their new one that's about to open has been doing this. And then they they can air condition and do all those things. But you're going to want to put in uh, very low light emittance glass that's specifically designed to not heat up, or everything's going to melt in there, including the people. Uh, you you've got to have a lot all the air conditioning and stuff. It, it's it's complicated. Right, um, but that can be done in those colonial structures. And then in theory, you could have trains that run, you could just do rooms, individual rooms with individual uh, train setups, which could be great because that way you can do it on a small scale and work your way up, small scale, haha, <laughs> pun not intended. Uh, or you could take one main train line that goes all the way around the structure and loops around the courtyard and comes back so that you can have really long runs of a single train and do some really interesting things that way. So those types of structures could work, I believe, uh, but they do have a lot of challenge and you're probably looking at extremely expensive museum grade upgrades to buildings if you're not going for the warehouse style buildings where you're gonna have the dust problems uh, even worse. There's just not um, anything in the more traditional American style that you would think of for model trains, but that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It could be a really neat way to go. You also could hunt around the country, and I'm not aware of this. It's certainly not in Leon, but, um, well, there is in Leon, right? There is an old train station. You could petition to try to get access to the train station and put a museum inside the train station. This is something that people have done traditionally in the United States. It works really great because you go there and the building itself is a train museum, and then there's trains inside of it, and it kind of ties the whole thing together. That's more or less in the middle of the city, uh, but it is in the middle of a rough area. It is in the middle of a market, and it is in use for other things like markets stalls so I don't know that there you would ever have a shot at something like that but that would be a prime location the muse the uh, train station in Granada was just recently turned into a new museum it was a museum previously but it was then empty for a while now it's a new one um, but as trains are coming into the country now, like actively happening right now, it is a perfect time to get in and do stuff like this, promoting trains and train consciousness and, you know, the whole, mo like, modeling could take off and be something that kids are interested in. Um, however, Leon is not a place that is getting trains right now. Granada is. Messiah is. Um, so they, I think, would be probably better targets. Also Granada, because it's just where so many museums are, where so much uh, activity is. You're going to have more tourists, and tourists could offset some of the cost of this to some degree, just the interest of seeing uh, trains. And, and then, of course, the question is, what are you going to model? Are you going to show American scenes? This is your introduction to the United States. Are you going to do European scenes? Here's what, you know, is it going to be international? Do a bunch of different things. Are you going to model what trains were like in Central America prior to them being ripped out in the 20th century? Like, there's a lot of different ways you could go. Uh, some things would be more challenging than others, of course. So, Leon, definitely a bit of a challenge because of the old colonial buildings, right? You'd find, um, I think, Chinandega would probably be a lot easier just because you have more modern buildings. Uh, Matagalpa, the same thing. Um, and in many cases, lower cost. The city center in Leon is colonial. So, those old colonial structures are very historic. Uh, and they often have high price tags attached to them when they're nice old colonial buildings, but then you'd be in the middle of the city. That's where you want to be for something like a train museum. However, you can go further afield in Leon and get extremely low prices. So if you're willing to be in Guadalupe, you're willing to be in Saragossa, you're willing to be in uh, Sutiava, places like that, you could get and have really, really cheap, large, in some cases, old colonial buildings. Uh, that In some places, you can find lots that have burned out, so you can just build whatever is appropriate for you at very low cost. Those things could make a lot of sense. The problem is visibility. Will you have the traffic? Will you be able to draw people in? The Sutiava Museum sits right on the plaza with the Iglesia Sutiava, uh, uh, Juan Baptista uh, Sutiava, which is in the main plaza. That's a beautiful location. There is a museum there. It's not very busy, though. No one knows about it. No one goes there. Um, I do plan to do an episode about it. Like, that would be fantastic. It would be a beautiful spot. That would be very accessible and work really well, but you'd have to work really hard to get the word out about your museum. No one's going to drive by and be like, and no one's going to be in the city center and just walking around going, oh, it's on our walking tour. No, it's too far, right? It's way out in a barrio, and it's in a barrio that people get warned about. I did an episode about why it's safe to go there, and it certainly is. It would be great. But people would be a little bit like, oh, I don't know. You know, that's, I, that's, in, that's not just in a barrio. It's in a low-cost barrio. Like, it's way out there. Um, which is great for Nicaraguans, who would never question it at all. But for tourists, they'd be like, mm, right? Everything's got to be in the high-cost city center. So... Those are kind of the challenges. I don't know of a specific place that would be great for it, but I do know that Leon has a lot of places that you could put one into without too much of a problem. 
certainly some of them are outrageously affordable and some of them are outrageously not affordable. Um, but nothing is custom built uh, or, or, or built in such a way that it would be really obvious. For a train museum, um, everything is going to be some amount of conversion, whether it's a giant bodega and you have to adapt a, a enormous open space to deal with it, or if you're looking at uh, uh, old colonials and you have to adapt them for modernization to be able to handle it, or if you're going to construct your own. Those are kind of kind of the options. Other things exist beyond that, but they're mostly uh, churches and and small houses and stuff that uh, you know putting it into a regular house or even a mansion um, would be very difficult, right? You can't take down the walls in most cases. Uh, too small space because for model trains you really need a lot of open space. You need space for the trains to be able to go long runs. That's what makes them fun. Is is you know not just going in a little circle, but actually doing stuff. And you just need a lot of space for that and you need a lot of space for people to be able to move comfortably around and look at it and you need to be able to have space for lights and perspective and just everything right and ones that i've been to when i was younger they would often have walkways that go right next to the train so you can get up but they'd have glass or ropes or something and be aware here people will not respect ropes and stuff in the way that they do in the north and so it would be very likely for people to be like well of course i can touch things of course i can so you really have to think about making more barriers because you don't have uh, a population that 100% is familiar with how everything works. It's going to be completely novel, not just the trains, not just modeling, but also the entire quiet, you know, hands-off museum experience is not the norm. So that's something that you really need to address by keeping a barrier of some sort, glass, whatever, which is generally needed anyway, but you really you may be thinking you can get away without it and you absolutely cannot so having but an ability to get up close is important but then it would there would also be a uh, higher ground where you could go up to a second level and look down on the trains and see them running and that kind of stuff is really cool that stuff you would probably have to build inside a structure i don't know where that's going to have that pre-existing for you but that makes sense, right? You want things to be a little bit like only seven and a half foot ceilings. You want to be as close as possible while being able to look down, but you don't want people able to throw things or drop things onto it. And remember, people will do that here, right? They're used to just dropping things everywhere. So there's just a lot of a lot of little social challenges uh, because this is an entire type of activity uh, that is otherwise unknown here. So I hope that answers your question. I hope that that encourages you to come down and actually build a model railroad museum in, in Leon. Um, that's, I guarantee there is no way to make it even pay for itself in your wildest imaginations. It will be a massive financial drain, but could it be cool? Could it be really interesting? Could it be really special? Absolutely. Um, you would need to, if you want to actually draw people in, you would need to run massive marketing campaigns. You would need to do a lot of things to get attention on it so that people would learn that it exists, learn how to interact with it, learn what is there, what to expect, um, and when and how to get there. Uh, all things that generally people do very poorly here, but with an effort, you could do that. You'd have to have great Facebook pages. You'd have to have great Instagram pages. You have to have a great YouTube page, uh, you know, stream, and, and put all that stuff together and be like, okay, we're building this really cool thing. Here's the, you know, experience it online. Now you can come see it in person. And people are like, whoa, that's really cool. Okay. But you still, it would be a very, very tiny audience. But as the middle class is growing in Nicaragua, people are looking for activities. People are looking for things to do. People are looking for ways to get out of the heat. And sometimes having something that's air-conditioned in the middle of the afternoon could be, oh, that's a thing I would go do, right? Just because people want a change of pace. Um, and, and so, yeah, uh, I think with the right effort, it could be uh, viable as an activity, uh, but never viable as a business, just like, it's not in the United States. I'm recording today with kind of the echo and the weird lighting and everything because it is so windy that I can't record outside at all. I'm stuck doing everything in the studio because it's that time of the year where the wind is so heavy I can never have a microphone outside. So I'm actually under a shelter where you can still see the trees behind me. All right, so the original question was about having a model train museum. And I think it's got some legs if you're completely willing to lose money and it's just a way to showcase your hobby. That could work out great. And I love model train museums. I will come visit it myself. But what if you want to open a model train store? He followed up with this. Maybe that's something he would do. And now this, it's very unlikely that you're going to want to mo run a model train store as a hobby. Actually doing modeling, running trains, having a museum, showcasing your craft, 
Absolutely. That generally makes sense. But running a store, while there are a few people out there who really enjoy just running a little store and showing people some goods and letting them buy some things, you're probably going to find that that doesn't apply. First of all, it's rare, right? It's a very rare person who, as a hobby, wants to have a store, especially something like this, instead of modeling. Now, if you have a museum and you also have a store and you spend your time in the store making the models for the museum, you can put these things together. I'm not saying that there's no way that this could work. I'm just, I want to give some background. Uh, but in general, what you're going to find is, like we said, with the modeling, a model railroad store is going to have a premium cost over the parts in the United States or in Germany, wherever they're coming from, Austria, places that do a lot of model trains. So anyone who's going to do it here is not going to get the discounts that you expect. In Nicaragua, they're going to pay a premium, maybe only 10%, maybe 100%. So things that it's already an expensive hobby, it would be a generally impossible hobby for most Nicaraguans. So that alone will dissuade people from doing this. Also, hobbies of this nature are extremely rare in Nicaragua. So you have an uphill battle of just educating people as to the hobby in the first place. The idea that you would sit around in your home and model trains is not something that's going to cross very many people's minds, especially as something to spend money on, let alone time and effort. And they can't go and see very much, maybe if you start a museum, examples of what it could be like in real life. So trying to get people to understand the fun of this would be very difficult. Because your shop could only have limited inventory, and most of it would sit around for a really long time because you are not going to have a single customer, that can be its own challenge. Anyone who's interested in buying stuff, even if they come and look at your store, they're going to quickly discover that they can, for the same prices as you have, order from online and have things shipped in specialty, and then they have a much larger selection. So anyone who learns anything about model railroading will really quickly learn about Walters and other online services. It will never occur to them to come to your shop, and they will start shopping online. If you ever found a single potential customer, of which there's very likely none, but just in case you did, you would probably lose them to the easy online ordering. I know for myself, if I wanted to do model railroading down here, which I would like to do, that would be really fun. I'm certainly going to go just go to Walters and place an order and have things shipped down. I don't need to have a store in order to get the parts and neither does anyone else. It's not the kind of thing where you really benefit by having a store. And it's not the kind of thing where the store could pay for itself. The store will have costs. Someone's got to run the store. Someone's got to secure the store. Someone's got to clean the store. Someone's going to got to pay the rent and the taxes. Remember, in Nicaragua, you have base business taxes. So having a business that makes no money will lose money because you have to pay taxes. Overall, the taxes are pretty low. But when you have to pay taxes even when you're not earning, that can hurt a bit. And what seems like, well, it's just a fun thing that I'm going to, it starts being, a, I'm paying to sit around in a store and not sell anything and not talk to anyone. I could just have model trains at home and have it cost less and I wouldn't have to travel to a store to do it. So think really carefully. This is the kind of thing where business analysis is, is critical that if this was something that made sense in Nicaragua, it is extremely accessible for a Nicaraguan to order from wherever they're going to get the same parts as you, Walters or whatever, ship it into Nicaragua, have a store, but they have more knowledge of the market, more access to people, lower costs for doing everything, fewer problems with the government as far as like tax office and stuff like that. Things are more lubricated for the local population. And so they have so many advantages over a foreigner doing this, and they have all decided this isn't a business that they're interested in because they don't think it's going to make money or whatever. It's so tempting as foreigners to bring a, but, but they must want to do these things that we want to do into the market, and they don't. And if you're thinking, well, there's going to be expats who want to do this, you're going to run into the same problems. The expats, by and large, don't want to do it. It's a rare hobby, even with expats. They are not going to learn about your store. You're going to not be able to advertise. You're not going to be able to get the word out. Expats are spread out all over the country. No one's going to travel hours to see a little store when they can just go online and have things shipped directly to their door. It might take a little while, but people who are doing model trains are probably okay with waiting a few weeks for their very special, exact BNSF locomotive and this, you know, track and this scale and all these things to show up because everyone's going to have a different line that they want to model, a different era, a different location, different vendors, all that specific stuff they can order online. They don't want to go to a store here. So even with expats, you're not going to find any place that has enough expats 
to even find two or three people who might be interested in doing this and finding someone who has the space set aside to do it will be extremely rare. Not that they don't exist, it's just with a population so small, you're getting into such a niche, there's very little opportunity. So in general, for this museum, yes, you could totally find justification for doing a museum. I get that part. A store, I think, should just be complete, there's zero absolutely zero possibility of it being viable. If you absolutely don't care about throwing away money to run a little shop because you think it will be fun for you to own a shop that never gets customers, then absolutely, that's fine. There's nothing, nothing morally wrong with it, right? It's your money. Throw it away as you want. But I think that that's a really, unless you just have a passion for being able to say you have a store that loses money, it's going to be a very silly thing to dedicate your time to versus just putting that same stuff in your house or having the museum or whatever. That store is not going to make sense. And in the bigger picture, for those who are following along, not interested in trains specifically, this is a great example of the gringo god syndrome, right? Where we're coming from another place and we think, oh, well, we have all this experience in North America. There must be things I can use from that and leverage here in Nicaragua, and it should be really easy. Things that would never be easy or be incredibly difficult, like where's a model train, museum, or store making money in the United States, in Canada, in Germany? Basically none do. It's extremely hard to have that be viable there, and taking something that we wouldn't do as a business there and bringing it here and thinking that it will somehow be viable. That is, it's so far from reality that our experiences in North America are essentially negatives here. It causes us to have even less knowledge and expectation of what the local market is going to respond like than if we just had no idea at all. If we had no background, if we were blank slates, at least we would come here with that kind of open-eyed, oh, I don't know, I need to learn. But when we're coming from North America, we have a tendency to bring with us this really heavy, oh no, I know how this works. I know, I've got ideas that they haven't thought of and it's gonna be brilliant. No, they've thought of it. They thought of everything and they turn it down. There are investors. If there was a, a model train market here, there are plenty of people who would put up the money just like that because it would be fun. Oh sure, it's not gonna make a lot of money, but it could make a little bit of money, done. So many people will be like, I'll do that right now. And do they? No, they don't. No one is running those things because it won't make money. It'll lose quite a bit. There's just more fun things you could do losing less money, even with model trains, than doing that. And so that kind of stuff. And it's everybody has it, right? This is universal. You're coming from outside Nicaragua. There is something that makes us all think that we are full of brilliant business ideas. The Nicaraguans are going to be so thrilled that we brought this knowledge, this experience that they didn't have. And they're all going to be so thankful that we're there to show them the things they haven't had. That is not the case. They have the internet. They have common sense. They have the ability to order online. They have the ability to look these things up. They're aware that these things exist. They're not completely oblivious to, the, to these ideas. They just don't do them because they're not interested or they don't make money. And so understanding that, that you're never going to come up with something new. You're never going to come up with a brand new idea is really important because we all think we do. And you would not believe. Now, model trains is different, right? That's why it's worth having a video about this because I've never had someone mention this before, although I have talked about it previously. Uh, so it must be more common than I realize. But so often the ideas that everyone has, every single person who's, who's a foreigner who comes to Nicaragua, comes and says, oh, I got this idea for a business. And of course, it's an idea that every single foreigner has had. And they all, it feels like it's novel. Like, well, but then why aren't people doing these businesses? Because people did and they failed or they looked into it and they knew it would fail or whatever. But that it's, it, there's not a bunch of new ideas. And the things that people tend to want to do here tend to be very simple, right? Opening a, a model train store, how hard would that actually be? making money at it, extremely hard. But how hard is it to actually open a store? Well, you just get a little bit of land, uh, uh, get a little rental space, you don't have to buy anything, you don't have to have special displays, you just go to Walters, you order some, some boxes of stuff, you set them on the shelves, you stick prices on them, and you sit there and wait for people to buy. That's the whole process. So it's super simple, it doesn't require any special know-how, any special connections, any special skills, nothing like that. And so ideas like that are especially difficult 
to get traction here because those things have had the most of everybody coming in and going, ha, ah, I could do that. I could do, like everybody could do that. There's not a single expat living in Nicaragua who couldn't have started a train store. Now, a train museum takes a knowledge of the hobby and, and a time and an effort in the craftsmanship. So that's a little bit different and that does make that special. But as a store, those things are so well covered that it's it's hard to explain just how well saturated the market is with all those things. And even if you came up with much more complicated things, it's very challenging. But if you're not bringing a very specific amount of know-how or expertise in the market to bear, then the chances that you're going to have any viability approaches zero. It is it is essentially impossible to come into a market like Nicaragua from somewhere else that's so different and have anything that we know we're able to do be useful unless it's a, a super specialty skill. Um, and I, I don't know a single person who has come in as an expat and had any skill viable in this market. None. Not, it's not like it's rare. It's zero. And so do they exist? Of course they do. But they, it is extremely rare. And those of us who are being successful in any way whatsoever, it is always in arbitrage. It is always where we're actually running businesses somewhere else, and it's just that we exist here. Or maybe we're doing a little bit of the work here, but it's always because of our connections somewhere else. It's always because we have a business in another country, or we have a uh, contact that's, that's shipping things for us to another country. It is never our existence in Nicaragua. It is never our labor in Nicaragua. It is never uh, our, our access to the Nicaraguan market that is creating any potential value. And so that's that's something that everyone needs to internalize because every single expat coming down has this vision of, of somehow just starting a business and having it magically make money. And, and in, in one of the hardest uh, markets in the world, definitely one of the hardest in the Western Hemisphere, uh, it should be, your natural reaction should be, wow, anything I do in Nicaragua is going to be so much harder than anywhere else I've ever imagined. And you shouldn't be like, and that makes me want to do it it should make you say, ah, I should really rethink this because there's little to no chance that I could ever even break even. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe if you'd like to help support the channel. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. We'll put it on the screen. As always, like, subscribe, share on social media. Tell your friends about the show, and I will see all of you tomorrow. And while we're here on the screen, take a moment to hit one of these videos that pops up and just watch another video. That helps a lot.